It's the Good as Gould Show with your host, Jake Gould, and we have a special guest on the line with us because I'm joined today by Terrell Gachet, who has quite the impressive resume as a boxer so far. He's a five-time Golden Gloves champion in his native Cleveland, Ohio, a two-time national champion, and a former U.S. Olympian as well, but he's looking to win a world championship in one of boxing's most exciting and wide-open divisions, that super welterweight 154-pound division that's on fire right now. And the last step to securing a title shot begins with his title eliminator against Erickson Lubin Saturday, September 19th on Showtime. So Terrell, thanks for being here today on the show. And if you look at my number 23 jersey, this Laker jersey I got on, you'll see here in LA, we got nothing but love for people who move from Cleveland to LA looking to win a championship. That's what's up, man. Yeah, I'm one of them. So me and LeBron, I'm uh, going to get that. Well, man, we're excited to see what you have in store for us September 19th, which will mark the first time since May of last year when you're back in the ring, which that fight, you know, three judges determined it was a draw, but the overwhelming majority of the boxing world, and myself included, agreed you did enough to win the fight. And with that long of a layoff and this whole COVID-19 thing disrupting sparring, well, a lot of people in your shoes would understandably opt for a stay-busy fight to shake off the ring rust, but not you. Your next fight... It's a title eliminator, and whoever wins on the 19th is in line for a title shot at the winner of September 26th unified 154-pound championship between Jermel Charlo and Jason Rosario, which sounds like all the motivation you need to keep putting work in the gym. So how do you stay preparing just for this particular fight against Lubin, and how do you stay focused on the task at hand knowing that beating him will get you a shot at all three belts next? You know, for me, I, like you said, and I'm a I'm an Olympian, so I'm no stranger to fighting the tough top opposition. You know, I've been boxing since I was 10 years old. Um, this year, I'll be 33, so I'm a veteran. Um, I, I feel like at this point, I don't need a tune up. Tune up for cars. We we were riding the deep end. So when I when I went when I beat Lubin, we're gonna go straight at the um the belt and uh I just been motivated like this whole time I've been off and just been staying focused grinding just uh I knew we'd meet up so I'm there I'm ready now you've got 21 wins to your name with only one loss to Arizlandi Lara and the one disputed draw as previously mentioned against Austin Trout now both Lara and Trout are southpaws and in between those two you actually knocked out another southpaw in Joey Hernandez who's a guy that's hard to look good against. And then now with Erickson Lubin, Terrell, that's your fourth consecutive fight against the lefty. Are you out to send some sort of message? Yeah, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm a really competitive guy. So when I lost to Lara, I heard a lot of talk. Um, Gache not good with southpaws, right? So I said, give me another southpaw, you know? So that was Joey Hernandez. And then once I won, I told him, give me another one. And, and then I heard Lubin mention my name, bring him on too, bring me all the soft parts I got. So now, uh, I even though they didn't give me the decision, I whooped uh, Austin Trout. It's nothing against him. He a good guy, but uh, I beat him. And um, I'm looking to do a better job against Lubin, like just so they won't even dispute it. You know what I mean? I'm trying to go out there and be dominant. I mean, yeah, sometimes you got to just take things into your own hands in the sport we love because, you know, as we've seen many times before, judges can get it wrong. So now you two were originally supposed to get it on last October, but then you broke your hand, had surgery, and that actually didn't seem to sit too well with Lubin as he took to social media to talk trash about you as if you pulled out of the fight. Does that add an extra layer to this fight? I mean, obviously there's business to take care of, but does this fight now become personal? Oh yeah, most most definitely. I mean, it gave me more motivation. But I'm a I'm a type of guy. I move with strategy, not emotion. So um, the game plan never changed, but it just made me more motivated. Like hearing him just made me get up and grind a little hard, you know. Cause the opposition, I've never even canceled a fight, but I had to. My coach, my coach, and everybody suggested I had pins in my hand. I had surgery. You know, so it was one of those situations where I had to. You know, I couldn't fight this guy with one hand. But now, during the time off, my hand, I did rehab. It's healed. It's no problem. So now we're going to get it on like me. 
you know, I've always thought that people can say and think whatever they want about me until they get their facts wrong. And when people talk about you, Terrell, and they talk about Terrell Gachet, one thing they can never say is that you had things easy. Because it's not easy being only eight years old when you lose your father to heart failure. And at what point did you then turn to boxing? And when was it that you realized that this sport could take you kind of far? Like when I first went to the gym, I was like 10. And uh, I just wanted to box. So my coach, he was an older guy, old school guy. And um, he really like, um, I kind of like mentor, looked up to him, kept me out of trouble. He used to come get me to go to church and things like that. So he kept me uh, focused and he told me, he was the first person to tell me like I was talented at boxing, like I could uh, take it far. So once I start, I, I actually lost my first two fights though, when I was an amateur, you know, I lost my first two fights. So mentally at 10 years old, I'm like, this ain't for me, you know? But he was like, you did good, man. You should, you should try it again. I went back and I won like 20 something straight and I was starting to travel, go out of town. And once I went to like different states, Kansas City here, New, uh, New Orleans and stuff like that, I was like, wow, this take me places. So I just stuck with it and I figured I could make a living off of it through the years. I mean, yeah, it's cool when you start something and it ends up taking you around the world. And when you look back at the journey of becoming a member of the U.S. Olympic team, what sticks out to, the, like, to you the most about that journey? I would say being able to block everything out because I actually, the first time I tried to make the team, I was 20, 21, I believe, yeah, 20 going on 21, and I missed, uh, I lost, and you know, Olympics come every four years, and people was telling me to go pro, you know, I shouldn't wait around, and just having a, having a vision and blocking all that out, and just sticking to it, and I finally, you know, and I made it, I would just say that, that was like, because, like, when nobody believe in it but you, when you're the only person to believe in something, it's like, it's, they make it that much better when you, uh, when you make it. I mean, yeah, boxing, it's a very isolated sport, but it definitely helps when you have a solid team and support system to fall back on. So I actually want to talk about that for a second. You come from Cleveland, Ohio, and I know you're a product of Glenville High School's class of 2005, and for those of you who don't know, Glenville's got a reputation as one of the biggest football powerhouses in Ohio, and it's led by Ted Ginn Sr. And in fact, Ted Ginn Jr. graduated from Glenville just one year before you did. Do you, Ted Ginn Jr., or any of the other guys from Glenville keep tabs on one another during your journeys up the professional sports ladder? Oh, yeah. We, um, we all, like, real close we share a common background like we all come from the same area um actually ted Ginn's father and my mom went to uh school together you know what i mean and i know ted Ginn personally he's a good guy we talk we you know keep in contact here and there and you know i used to go watch his games he was fast he watched my fights and everything like that too so every not only him it's a lot of numerous other guys my cousin cardell jones he's from glenville Frank Clark, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. We all keep up with each other, so it's a, a tight-knit community. Now, what about your relationships with your Olympic teammates? Errol Spence Jr. was an Olympic teammate of yours in 2012, and he's getting back in the ring versus Danny Garcia, which is a good fight. I mean, are you excited to see him defend his title and show what he's capable of in his first fight since his car crash? He's got that WBC and IBF titles, and he's already getting back in there with a lion in Danny Garcia. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm definitely young because, you know, that's my guy. We, uh, you know, stuff we're doing, I was talking about it back then and uh, we really living out our dreams. So, you know, when we got into that car accident, like, you know, I, I talked to him on the phone, I texted him and we kept in contact. And I, I take my hat off to him because he's going right back into the deep end. Like he take a tune up as well as me going to a big fight, Danny Garcia, dangerous fight. And that's, that's what Errol Spence is about. Like, that's the type of fighter we are. We like to challenge ourselves and test ourselves, you know what I mean? So I, um, I'm pulling for, for Errol to go out there and do what he do, stay undefeated, keep his belts, and uh, yeah. Hey, man, it's, I think it's pretty cool to see that living and training in L.A. doesn't stop you from maintaining those close relationships with those Olympic teammates of yours and the friends you have back in Cleveland. And 
So now that makes me bring to your family. What, what about your family that you've got home with you? What role do they serve in keeping you grounded and getting in the gym and grinding every single day? Yeah, it's like, cause we do this to um, better, better our family life. You know what I mean? To, uh, you know, your, your kids, my, I got, I just had a son. Um, he's six months. My daughter, she's 12 years old. You know, my mom, she's been with me, uh, support me every step of the way my sister all my people back home they fly to all my fights so even in training camp they come down and watch me train and you need that you need that motivation to uh keep pushing it's like it ain't really hard work when you when you got a vision when you got a, a goal you know what i mean when you uh you know doing it to better your, your life and your family life it's a it's, Easy work, hard work be easy work when you're doing it for that. Yeah, I mean, competing at the highest level of professional sports has got to be one of the coolest feelings in the world. I obviously have never done that before, but, you know, obviously you have. It obviously helps when skills pay the bills, but a lot of athletes forget how important it is to diversify your revenue streams. And from what I hear, you actually have a pretty nice side hustle of buying and flipping houses. Is that the case? Yeah, I, um... I really got one of my um, guys and he was talking to me about this way before I start even really getting decent paychecks. Like I was just making a few dollars here and there. You know, we starting out three, four, five, six thousand. And he was telling me in Cleveland, the market is like, you can buy houses for a little bit cheaper. You just buy them and fix them up. You can sell them for a higher or the equity on a house appreciate, you know, your house appreciating stuff like that. He was just teaching me the game. And I was like, hey, I ain't got no lose. I, I, I want to have something else coming in other than boxing. So I bought a few houses back home, and now I'm working on my third one. It's getting fixed right now. So I was able to sell a house um, last year, and it's working out pretty good for me. Hey, that's dope, man. I mean, definitely cool to have something that keeps you grounded outside of the ring and sharp with a passion project. Yeah, it do. It, it keep you, like you said, like, we're not going to be boxing for once you're done, you want to have other money coming in. And we got to use this to, you know, open up doors in other areas. So I'm just uh, trying to be cool on the inside of the ring and outside of the ring, business mind as well, and stay sharp. You know? Yeah, people sometimes forget that athletes have more than one hustle and have an opinion on more than just the sport they compete in. Now, I actually want to know with that said, about the taste in music that you got. If you could only listen to one artist for the rest of your training days, who would that be and why? Man, that's a hard one. But um, to be honest, man, I, I listen to a lot of Gucci, Future. But to, if I had to pick one, I'm going to go with Gucci. Gucci. Guwap, man, Guwap. I love Gucci, man. That's that's awesome, dude. If you could only pick one tape of a fighter, though, retired or active, watch for the rest of your life, who would that be and why? Hard one, man. But uh, I think one of my favorite fighters, I, I had to go with Andre Ward. Yeah, SOG, Andre Ward, one of my favorites of all time as well. I know he's retired, but, you know, I feel like he could easily be champion today if he was still fighting. What do you think would happen if he came out of retirement and fought Canelo? Is that something that you would like to see? Nah, I don't. I want him to enjoy his retirement, keep his old, keep his belts. I mean, you know, retire on top. But I think it would have been – I would have loved to see that fight a little while back, though. I think he would have been a, um, out-thought him in the ring. That's what he good at. He a good thinker. I mean, yeah, credit to Andre. He got out with his health. And his wealth. So in particular, the reason why he did that was because he mastered the sweet science and knew the object of the game was to hit and not get hit. Now, you actually have like that high guard style that you rock with. Where did you get that from? I got that actually when I was um, with my first coach, my, uh, my childhood coach. He just taught us. It's called the four corner defense. We just keep your hands um, nice, and, nice and tight. And, you know, your elbows locked in. And it's hard for guys to get, you know, get a good shot. Like, have you seen most of my fights you watch? I look the same way as I came in. So I, I barely get, like, hit a lot. I don't take a lot of punishment. But, I mean, we all get hit. Can't, can't swim without getting wet. But for the most part, I'd be ready to uh, go right back. 
I mean, ready to go back. I mean, that sounds like you're ready to get in the ring right now, man. Yeah, man, I'm ready. Like, you know, when I took a little time off after um, the loss, the fights I took after that, you could see I stepped my game up. I've been taking all the best fights on the table. Now it's moving. Once I get through, you know, I don't like to think ahead. I got to take care of this young guy. He a young guy. He's 24. I'm, 30, I'm about to be 33. It's a good challenge for me. I love challenges. I'm going to show that, you know, I'm ready to uh, get that belt. So first thing first, get him out the way. Then the next step, the belt. Well, it all goes down this Saturday, September 19th on Showtime at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific with Erickson Lubin versus Terrell Gache. Winner will be in line for a title shot in one of the most exciting divisions in boxing, 154 pounds. Division is absolutely on fire. So once again, Terrell, thank you for coming on the show, and good luck to you, my man. For having me, bro. Thanks.